Well, good morning. Um, thank you all for being here this morning for our 12th annual Fall Environmental Forum. Uh, this year, we're exploring a completely new topic, which is innovations in sustainable furnishings. Um, and I really appreciate that all of you are here this morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce the president of Elon University, Dr. Leo Lambert, who uh, is here this morning to welcome you and to thank you for being here. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Janet. It is a pleasure to welcome this group to Elon, the 12th year that we have had the Environmental Forum. And the first thing I want to do this morning is commend Janet, Professor Janet McFall's leadership. She's director of the Center for Environmental Studies at Elon, has been a force behind this forum for many, many years. And Janet, you're leadership has had a big impact on Elon University. You've made it a better place. Thank you for all that you do here. We're proud of you. And it's a special pleasure that today we are bringing together uh, this conference under the sponsorship of the Center for Environmental Studies and the Sustainability Furnishings Council, uh, which I think is a natural marriage uh, to the furniture industry, as we all know, is a major economic force in North Carolina, the old, the old uh, big three of textiles, tobacco, and furniture. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about the furniture industry is we're beginning to see a resurgence of an industry that I, I'm told by Mitchell Gold this morning is a $40.3 billion industry in North Carolina. That's a lot of money. And uh, so I think it's wonderful that these forces are coming together today and Elon University is pleased and honored to have this conversation uh, on our campus. I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the things, for those of you who are guests uh, to Elon, some of the things that are taking place on our campus here that we're very proud of. We have um, a well thought out, serious environmental sustainability plan on our campus. And every year as we do our annual object objective settings, that is one of the guiding plans that shapes our uh, annual planning processes at the university. And you can visibly see on campus the impact of, of the plan. We're, many of you were, I thought you were going to be at, but you were certainly near yesterday when you were on South Campus, a new 10-acre solar farm that is going to be installed beginning this fall at the Elon Environmental Center. And uh, this will generate enough on a good sunny day, will generate about 25%, I'm told, of Elon's electricity needs, or the equivalent of, of such. It has been a process uh, working with Duke Energy and all of the other partners uh, to make this work, but we are excited uh, to finally see this project come to fruition. We're proud that we have a green building policy at Elon since the environmental sustainability plan was put into effect. Every new building that we have constructed at the university and every major renovation has been uh, under the LEED program. And many of our new facilities have achieved gold LEED status, including Lindner Hall in the Academic Village, our new alumni field house, the Colonnades neighborhood, and the Loy Center, the addition to Greek housing, also received uh, a LEED platinum status. And of course, as many of you are aware, the Colonnades neighborhood has a wonderful geothermal system, 120 wells sunk under that beautiful quad that provides all the heating and cooling uh, for Colonnades Dining Hall and five residence halls. So we're making some progress here. And I think what we've discovered, I think will be a theme of your conference, is that what's good for the environment has also proven to be good for Elon University's bottom line. Uh, this is good for students because it helps, it help, it's a way for us to help control costs at the university over the course of the long term, which means your tuition uh, uh, dollars aren't increased as rapidly. And of course, we're also having the kind of environmental impact that we envision. We are delighted today. I've had a chance to meet briefly Dr. Jonathan Chapman, Professor of Sustainable Design at the University of Brighton in the UK for sharing his expertise with us. 
Dr. Chapman, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to stay for your address. I have a university board of trustees audit committee meeting. And believe me, I would much rather be here for your address. But uh, to introduce uh, our speaker, I'd like to now turn the program over to Susan Ingalls, who is executive director of the Sustainable Furnishings Council. Oh, well, that's a little slightly awkward. <laughs> Have a wonderful conference, everyone. It's good to be with you. now found. I just handed the phone to somebody else to take care of him. I'm Susan Eagles, and I thank you all for being here, and I thank you, Dr. Lambert, for supporting the Fall Environmental Forum ongoingly for all that Elon is doing as a leader in this space. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> um, so I am going to... Um, introduce Jonathan. And before that, I'm going to do a few thank yous. And I don't know whether I should be using this thing or not. But I talk so loud, I expect everybody can hear me. Um, I, I specifically want to thank Janet, too. And I want to thank Susan Manring at the business school, because she is my friend who told me such a thing as this Fall Environmental Forum existed. So thank you for having made this connection. We're, SFC is really excited and honored to be part of this. Um, uh, Sustainable Furnishings Council is a membership organization. Our members are companies that are involved in the home furnishings industry in various ways. So they do include suppliers of materials, manufacturers of product, stores in which you buy furniture and other furnishings, interior designers who um, specify these products for your homes and offices. All these businesses have made a commitment to sustainability, to transparency, and to continuous improvement. And we make it our business to support them in realizing their commitment. Members use a member seal in their marketing and advertising. And when they're implementing sufficient best practices, they use a tag on their product. So that's a, that is um, uh, our mechanism for helping to save the world. <laughs> and we are very, very glad to have a lot of our members involved in today's event. Several of our board members are among the speakers today. Mitchell Gold will be hearing from in a bit, and Robin Wilson will be hearing from in a bit. And then this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from um, a, a, on a panel um, Mark Horde of E.J. Victor, Hillary Pope of Carolina Mattress Guild, and Jason Phillips of the Phillips Collection, who I know because of the telephone call is on campus already. And he's bringing some furniture for you to see. There is, a, we're going to do some show and tell throughout the day, and there are interesting displays of materials and things in the back. And at lunch, we're going to be having table topics, and they're going to be about various subjects about furniture, and you can choose what you want to talk about, wood or other materials or whatever. So I um, am excited about all we're going to learn today, especially from Jonathan Chapman, our keynote. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jonathan. Um, Jonathan has come here from across the ocean. Jonathan is at the University of Brighton in the UK. He is a professor of sustainable design, which is, and he's on the faculty of art. So this is a design guy. And he understands about designing from thinking about the materials to thinking about after that product is not used anymore. And that is, um, I think, uh, one of the remarkable things about um, Jonathan's process. So engaging with issues of design ecology, and the human condition, Professor Chapman's work seeks to reveal the behavioral phenomena that shapes patterns of consumption and waste. He's widely cited on these subjects and referred to as a mover and shaker. He missed the music at um, the Akron, so I know, but nobody saw you move or shake. However, we know you're a mover and shaker in the world of design, and you are a 
part of a new breed of sustainable design thinker. Uh, you have written a couple of books, and I think you're going to be talking from those books, so I'll just leave it at that, Emotionally Durable Design. Um, and I do want to mention that you have been cited not only in news media and in, um, by academic institutions, but the House of Lords has called upon you and your expertise on these uh, matters when they were concerned about making an inquiry into waste reduction. So this guy is um, an expert, and I am really glad you're here with us. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for all you're going to share with us. And I'll leave it to you to tell what else you want us to know about. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very generous introduction. OK, um, right, well, thank you all for, for being here. And thank you very much, Elon, for inviting me and uh, putting up the time, really, to, to listen to, to someone's opinions. Because actually, I guess that's all we've really got in all of this, right, is just different opinions and ideas about how to move forward. I guess in 100 years' time, we can look back and we'll know which ones were the right ones. Uh, but at the moment, certainly from the perspective of design, it's all about ideas and what's possible. We're like, um, we're so over blame, you know? Like, whose fault is it? Why is this happening? you know, trying to track the origin of the crisis in terms of which field, which industry, is it consumers, is it government, is it business? I don't really care, actually. I'm just more interested in thinking about this afternoon, tomorrow, and next week, and next year, because that's much more interesting. Um, and fortunately for me, uh, being in design, that's kind of the community that I'm in. We're much more interested in tomorrow. So um, some of this is scripted, as in I'm going to walk you through some key stages of um, the color blue <laughs> and why that is particularly meaningful. <laughs> and uh, then maybe later I'll give you a lecture about this subject. Uh, yeah. Um, so. Emotionally durable design. Well, this is, uh, I guess it's a theory, um, but really, if we, if we strip away uh, words like, you know, theory, uh, which makes things sound quite technical and important stuff, it's, actu it's actually just an idea, which it's an idea about thinking, well, how can we um, increase resource efficiency, you know, cut waste, cut the consumption of resources by simply designing things that last longer. Um, sometimes it's referred to as product life extension. Um, now, you, you frame it as a simple question like that, and um, it, it kind of makes my whole life seem really obvious and pointless because, well, that's a really simple question, isn't it? How can you design stuff that lasts longer? Um, but actually, when you really start to look at it more closely, you realize it's actually pretty complicated. Because conventionally, we tend to think about durability in physical terms. You know, how long stuff lasts. You know, will it break? Will it crack? Will it fracture? How is it in, the, in different weather conditions? Those sorts of things. Um, but actually, there's a whole other side to this debate, which is much more about people. And why do we keep certain things and not other things? Because landfill sites and recycling facilities around the world are rammed full of things that still work. You know, they're not broken. But something else has happened that's put them there. So really, my research is about drilling into that observation and trying to understand, well, why do we throw things away that still work? And how can we design products which people want to hold on to? Because it's actually really easy to design. And I mentioned it yesterday in one of the workshops. It's very easy to design, um, for example, 
a, um, a cell phone which lasts, you know, technically and physically lasts for 10 to 15 years. That's actually really easy to do. In fact, most of our cell phones already do last that long. But it's very difficult to design a cell phone which a person wants to keep for 10 to 15 years. That is a really tricky design challenge. And also from a business perspective, in terms of money, that's another, it's another challenge, isn't it? How do you make money, lead the market by selling less? Okay, so hopefully in the next 25 minutes, I'm gonna tell you how to do that. At Brighton University, I run a master's degree in sustainable design, and we spend a year talking about this. Um, and, and students at the end, they just about get it. So hopefully, <laughs> you're gonna show them all up and get it in 25 minutes. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the generous introduction, I, I really appreciate that, because, you know, I, to start with, when I was pushing these theories around and I published my first book on the subject in 2005, which is ages ago now, right? I mean, everything changes. But um, I think I was seen as a bit of a, a, bit of a hippie, um, which I am. Uh, and I was also seen as, a, you know, a dreamer, you know, an idealist dreamer, you know, brilliant. In universities, that's cool. Enjoy yourself, have fun. And then when you graduate and go into the real world, then we're going to need to <laughs> reconnect with reality and sort things out. But, at, but actually, um, over time, partly through the success of the theory in education, and I've, I've, I've taught about the theory in, in some big design schools all around the world and talking to great people like yourselves. I've also been invited, as, as, as was said, to the House of Lords, and actually last, last week, uh, the UN uh, published an article about emotionally durable design. Uh, the UN in, um, International Development Organization. So if you Google that, I don't know, emotionally durable design UN, you'll find it. And, and it's this really short, simple article about why is this an interesting idea and who might it be useful to. Um, so it's surprising to find the work creeping into all these spaces. Also, I, I consult on the theories to, um, to some fairly major global brands like Puma, the big sports lifestyle brand, um, and Sony have recently been developing some ideas around the theories about how we can develop um, one device for life. How do you do that? You know? um, and I'm discussing the ideas with IKEA at the moment in terms of how we can actually start to think about alternative categories of products which are based on different values and ideas, you know? So it's bigger than me, the idea. So um, so as I said, durability, it isn't just about torn seat covers or blown chips or cracked plastics, because things like love an attachment, fascination, desire, all these kinds of things, they can also break. They can also kind of stop working. And anyone who's been in a bad relationship will probably relate to that, right? You know, sometimes it works out well, and it lasts, and it grows and evolves and gets better. Other times it's pretty much a downhill journey from the first date. And it's, and it's interesting how when you look at the psychological dimensions of consumption and why we buy things and why we keep things and why we throw other things away and replace them, it's incredible the number of parallels between human to human interactions and human to product interact. It's incredible. And I wish I had more time to go into that. Um, yes, I do. human-to-product interaction. <laughs> Just talking. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. So I use the term orphaned objects, which is quite, it's quite a helpful little piece of rhetoric because, um, you know, it suggests a kind of unwanted thing, but which is still perfectly fine. But it's just somehow unwanted, and there's a, there's a kind of a... 
there's a, a bit of heartache attached to it, which I think is interesting. Um, if you talk about fly tipping or people throwing stuff out the back of the van, it doesn't tend to connect with people very much. Um, but orphaned objects are interesting. I mean, I, I, I did, um, in the early stages of my master's degree, um, back in 2000, I, I did spend a bit of time kind of mining landfill sites and drilling down into them and, and slicing through. And if you, if you were a, let's say you're, doing, you're a geology major, you'd really get this. But if you think about layers and strata in the earth, in the earth's crust, and how you can almost date each layer based on different geological periods. A landfill site is actually the same. You can go down, and if you talk about music, for example, you've got right down low there, you've got vinyl, then you go a little higher, and you've got cassettes, and then you go up, CD, you know, and it's really interesting, you know, just that kind of archaeological history of the stuff we throw away. Fascinating stuff, and so much of it works. Um, so really, landfill sites and dumps, they're not graveyards for products, they're orphanages, because the stuff still works. There's nothing wrong with most of it. So why does this happen? You know, what, what, what is it about? And if I could, I'd, it, I spent four years doing a PhD asking that question, and, um, and there's a few answers, but I'm going to try and just kind of sum it up, um, your kind of 80,000-word thesis. I'm going to try and sum it up in a paragraph, which is, that, which is to say that we, um, products are mirrors and projectors, okay? And that's obviously meta metaphorical. Um, so what that means is that a product is deployed by us to, to reflect our values to us. So if I want to feel cooler, more organized, Maybe I'll buy a product which kind of speaks to me about those kinds of values. It's, the, it's a really up-to-date organization device. I buy it, and suddenly I feel more organized. I haven't even taken it out of the box yet, but I feel more organized. It's kind of like getting a gym membership. <laughs> it's like, I, I feel already. I can feel the difference. I haven't even been yet. So we... It's funny, we kind of surround ourselves with objects that comfort us in these ways. But what they also do, in addition to being mirrors, is they also project. So they tell everybody else about the kind of stuff you're into and the things you want to be and the person you wish you were. Um, the problem with that is that the... Um, the problem with that is that the self, our concept of self, who we are, and our identity and the things we aspire to, is continually evolving and changing, you know, who we are. It's changing all the time. Whereas the stuff, you know, the products we surround ourselves with to mirror and project those ideas, they stay pretty frozen in time. They don't really evolve very much. So... It's only a matter of time before my idea of what's cool or what reflects my beliefs and direction, it's only a matter of time before that becomes actually a pretty stale reminder of what I used to be into. And at that moment, from, a, from an experiential point of view, we just want to be, we want to separate from that thing and we want to replace it with a more up-to-date reflection of our new updated values. And it's really interesting because from a psychological perspective, you can, you can actually stick that label on pretty much every human product divorce out there. It's very, very interesting. There are, of course, other issues that influence waste, like technological obsolescence, wear and tear, different things. But from a behavioral point of view, that's incredibly consistent, that, that single idea. OK, but you know, we also need to be quite realistic. And what I am certainly not standing here saying to you that we should design things that last forever. Because you know? actually, there, there are many products where uh, it's probably better to replace them you know, at certain points in their life and recycle the component parts 
and replace them with, for example, a more energy efficient um, version. And I think large white goods, uh, fridge freezers, um, are a perfect example of a product which, at certain points in its life, it's better to, uh, it's better to replace it you know, responsibly. But in the context of furniture, which uses a fair amount of energy and resources through the um, production and distribution stage, but then during the use phase, it actually is fairly low impact, if not, in some cases, zero impact. So in those cases, product life extension is, is, is a fantastic and important way to be thinking. But there are some objects, some things, some categories of things which improve through the passing of time. I think people kind of do a bit. But then other things, they take a downhill journey the moment you get them out of the box. Like most screen-based products are like that. You know when you get like, um, you know if you get an iPhone or, sorry, any brand of phone, and you, uh, you peel off that film, like that beautiful moment. <laughs> Some people wait for that, don't they? They save it for like a few days and then they do it. <laughs> Just so you get this little second honeymoon, fantastic. So, you know, and you, and you peel off this film and for a moment it's new. And then you get your grubby thumbprint on the screen. And, and from that moment on, it's just, it's just not quite the same because it's designed in such a way that it's absolutely fragile. And I don't mean fragile in a physical sense because they're, I don't know, they're pretty robust things considering what we, <laughs> what we do with them. I mean fragile in a kind of psychological sense. It takes so little for them to become unwanted. They're very fragile. Interestingly, this isn't just a conversation around small batch production or one-off craft items, you know. I mean, look at the you know, denim jeans. Perfect example of a mass-manufactured item in the fashion sector. You know, we c you could almost not think of a more ruthlessly um, trend-driven obsolescent space than the fashion sector, and yet there are examples within that space of, of, of product categories or genres of products which are absolutely about aging and improvement and things that get better. Fantastic leather brogues, you know, handmade shoes that need to be polished and looked after and over time you develop a bond with them and when the base wears you take them to a, a shop to get the soles replaced you know that's that's that happens it's surprising how many things we already interact with that are based on these ideas so but what what is um what is perhaps even more interesting than that is when you as a designer you know you start to think well you know, we create objects and we put them into the world, but that's where their life begins, really. Often for, from a designer's perspective, that's the end. It's like, great, I'm, I'm on to the next project now. But really, that's when the product life begins, is when it gets out into the world, people start using it, misusing it. Um, and that's where a lot of these stories take place, you know, and a lot of these things take place. Um, and a student of mine developed a, a series of textiles which had some kind of um, coating on. It was just printed on to the textile. Uh, I'm aware that there's some people here who have great expertise in this area, so I'm not going to show my ignorance and go into any more detail than that. But it had a coating on the textile. And what happens is, as the textile begins to take on stains and wear and tear and use, a, a, a pattern begins to reveal itself that you couldn't actually see before. So, okay, this is a crude example, a tablecloth that reveals a pattern as stains occur. But what it does do is it starts to suggest that there are other ways we could think about how we relate to our material possessions. You know, maybe they become like diaries that record things that happen. You know, I've got a... My dad's house is this door frame, 
And he, with his marker pen, since I was about two, he used to measure how tall I was on the door frame. Does anyone else have that kind of thing? Yeah. So if he ever moves house, he's going to have to take that door frame <laughs> with him. And it's interesting how certain things, we're okay with that. We think, yeah, of course, that's what you do. Yeah, this life, you know, I want to remember all these cool things that happen. And then with other things, for some reason, we feel totally differently. We say, no, no, I don't want to remember that. Uh, we should boil, boil wash that at 100 Celsius with chemicals because that's what you do. <laughs> Which is odd, isn't it? Because accidents happen. Things happen. You know, and if any of you have kids, then you'll realize, you know, this, accidents really do happen. So the question then becomes, well, how can we create things that grow old gracefully, you know, that age really, really well, and that aren't just ruined the moment the smallest little thing happens to them? And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about fixing and how we can develop objects that are easier for people to fix themselves, you know, and how they could be motivated to do that. But for now, we can talk more simply about, well, how can we, how can we think about growing old gracefully. And this is a, another student of mine who developed this uh, a, tea, a teacup, which has some sections are glazed, some sections are not glazed. And as you drink coffee or tea over time, it begins to reveal this pattern, which is very similar to the idea I just mentioned uh, with the stained tablecloth. It's not all about staining, by the way, but it's certainly an interesting aspect of the theory. But at this point, the objects start to become storytellers. You know, as you, it's like reading a book. You know, as you, get, as you turn each page, it kind of gets better and it changes over time. And these are fantastic products. And they sell them in the uh, London Design Museum now as just really great exemplars of how, through design thinking, someone has managed to flip a situation right on its head and create value out of something that was previously considered valueless, destructive. And I think that's one of the things designers do. You know, we, we find opportunities for value creation. And we find ways to manipulate people and affect behavior. I think the problem is that historically, that manipulation has simply been a driver to increased consumption and uh, economic growth. But when you think about sustainable design, we're still talking about manipulation and changing people's attitudes. It's just with a slightly different agenda than simply economic growth. Economic growth is part of it, because if there's two brands, one of them is trying really hard to be more sustainable and the other one isn't, then let's grow that one. <laughs> And then market share transfers to the people that are trying. And at that point, it becomes a kind of Darwinian process where you support the people that are doing good things. And by doing that, you put pressure on the people that aren't. That's a very political thing to do. So this certainly isn't about asking people to stop buying stuff. It certainly isn't about that. We did a project with Puma as well, which, um, which looked at how you could develop uh, sneakers, which through use begin to reveal branding messages and ideas to customers. And this concept hasn't, actually wasn't um, followed through. But what it did do is it opened up some ideas about children's footwear markets and how we could um, use these principles in children's footwear. Uh, because as you can imagine, the way children wear shoes um, is slightly different, um, and you can have lots of fun with it and extend the life enormously. Has anyone seen this chair before? Some people, yeah. It's, it's, a really, it's big in, in Europe. Um, it's called the Trip Trap Chair from stocky and it's been around for over a decade now but 
It's a beautifully simple child seat, uh, which is just CNC routed out of a sheet of, um, I think it's birch. Um, and it's incredibly simple. Sorry, CNC routed is, um, it's like a drill that cuts into sheets of material, but it cuts downwards and it also cuts sideways. So you can kind of print out shapes from material and then slot them together. And it's a very, um, it's quite a cost-effective way of working with large sheet material things. So obviously this chair has been designed with that in mind. Um, but that's not really why I wanted to talk about this. Um, this, this chair it can be adapted <laughs> and updated so as the child grows, so they can sit in it from six months of age. As the images at the bottom show, you can literally grow up in this chair, move the seat plate downwards as you get bigger. And the chair kind of adapts and changes as you adapt and change, which is a really nice example of a very successful competitive furniture product which has been designed with that kind of thinking. It grows and adapts with you. Um, and it's a very stylish object. It comes in a whole range of colors or flavors, as Apple would say. <laughs> and then there's one other reason why I wanted to talk to the, about this. And it is that we've got one in, in our house. Because when you've got kids, they have these chairs out for, for the first few years of their life. And they, they're usually massive objects that take up loads of room, and you're tripping over them all the time. And, and no matter how you decorate your house, there's always this lump of plastic and steel tubing. And, and they're, they're quite intrusive things. So to have something that's been designed in such a way that you don't mind having it around is interesting. The, the way that you adjust it is down the side. You can't quite make it out here. But there are a number of small Allen key fittings that screw into these horizontal um, uh, steel rods. So you just loosen that, and the two sides move apart, and then these plates become loose. So you adjust it, and then you tighten it up again, and it traps it all in place. What's interesting about that is that my son is six years old. Um, for the last few years, he's wanted to do it. So he says, he can feel, he, he always wants to do it. He says, I think I've grown now. And I said, like, yeah, but we did it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, but look, I'm really, uh, it's kind of, no, no, you, it's fine. But, but when the time does come, it's like this kind of rite of passage. It's this sort of, it's like graduating. You know, he, he, for him, that's in his world, it's a big deal. So him and I together, you know, dads and lads. We sit down with the tools and we, and we change it together. And he stands back and admires his work, you know, the seats like that and the foot's like that. And then we redo it. So for him, it has great meaning. And it's very interesting because he's asking loads of questions now about why the other things don't do that. And why can't his shoes, why isn't there one of those little Allen key things so that his shoes can... <laughs> you know, stretch out and change. And I'm thinking, well, that's really interesting because this product has been a kind of teacher to him. You know, it's introduced him to some different ways of thinking about things. And actually, if we're talking about how we shape future generations of consumers, then that's really relevant. So thinking of the object as an educator is, is actually quite an interesting way to go. OK, so another really interesting strategy for inviting people into the process of creating things is to customize, to allow them to customize their things. Now, a person can customize an object whether, whether you like it or not. You know, sometimes it's called hacking products, product hacking. You know, I could take um, this. And I could, I don't know, I could scratch something into the, into the back of it, or I could spray it yellow, whatever. You know, people do these things all the time. It's, it's, there's nothing new about that. But what's interesting is when you design products that kind of invite people to do that. And this, this light 
uh, from Chen Carlson's, a really good example of um, a piece of home furnishings, you know, a, piece of, a piece of lighting, sorry, which um, it kind of invites you, I guess, while you're eating your cereal or walking around the house or whatever, it's constantly just asking questions about what, what would you put in here, what can you put in here. Some people put plants in these things, you know, with UV bulbs, you know, which spill out, you know, like um, trailing plants. I've seen people fill them with brightly colored marbles. And, and, and again, that's a bit more trippy, but it's that sort of slightly different way of creating lighting effects. I've got a, a, a friend who got one of these and he just painted the inside blue. So he can suddenly have a blue light, you know, and it's, it's interesting for designers to just step back a bit and allow their customers to get involved. You know, sometimes we call that unfinished products or incomplete products. You know, how much should you really finish things off? And is there a way to allow people in, get people involved? OK, so if I was to ask, we're not going to do this, but if I was to ask you all to think of, you know, what's your most cherished possession, right? I mean, for some of you, it would be instant, like you go, oh, it's easy. It's this, I don't know, this necklace, which, I don't know, a certain person gave to me on a certain day. And uh, that's really important to me, and so that's my most cherished possession. Some people would say, my phone, definitely my phone, because without that, I'm pretty much screwed, because it's got everything. I wouldn't even be able to get home without it. <laughs> you know? and, it and it's funny, because we all have these very different ideas around what a special thing is, what a special object is. But there are some, you know, if each of us was to get, if each of us, you know, if I said, right, go home in a week, I want you to come back and I want you to bring in your most cherished possession. It's interesting because I know mine is, um, I've got these two, uh, uh, like two rocks that I got off a beach. Um, and one of them, about, it's one of them's about twice the size of the other one. And they're both flint, which is a rock you get on the south coast of England. So when my little boy was a toddler, uh, he came stumbling up this beach with these two rocks, right? And he was still learning to talk, so I'm not going to do the voice. But he basically said, uh, As this one's daddy and this one's Jasper. And I kind of, uh, and at that moment, I became a dad, you know, in my head. Sorry, it's a bit gushy. Sorry about that. But, <laughs> but this is, you know, these things. Are, so, so for me, those two things, they're not rocks anymore. They're like, I don't know, they've just become something else. You know, and it's funny how we choose to keep certain things and not other things. And if I showed someone else these two stones, they'd probably say, why have you got two stones in you, on your shelf? Like, what's that all about? But because I know the story, they have great personal significance to me. And I'm sure that most of you have things a bit like that. Some of you won't, because you're obviously far too cool for that. But some of you will. And it's interesting, because if each of us was just to be really honest and bring all our stuff in and put it on a table, and we invited anyone in to come and have a look, it would just look like a table of junk. I'm pretty sure it'd be like a yard sale. Like, what's all this stuff here? But if you asked anyone to say, OK, who brought in this, I don't know, this um, rubber ball with teeth marks in it? And then one of you would say, oh, that's me. And uh, that was from uh, this dog I used to have. And uh, sadly, he's not with us anymore. And this ball, you know, and it's, there's a story in everything, in everything. So the challenge is, how can we create objects that we can put stories into so that they have that sort of endurance, that emotional endurance? So this is a really interesting. Um, design that was inspired after this, there was this, des there was this furniture designer, um, well, he was a graphic designer and a furniture designer <laughs> in the UK called Sam Stanistreet, who uh, was really taken with the book and some of the ideas in the book. And he created this um, put together yourself um, child seat. Um, and there's something about the way that the, the packaging has some pigment in it, some vegetable based pigment. You take the parts out, your hands get grubby, 
the child puts the seat together, they sign the work, and for years to become, from years to come, it's kind of like a photograph that stores all that information in it, and it becomes irreplaceable, it becomes unique. Um, really interesting, um, really interesting work. I mean, you can buy on the market little tins of clay, you know, and you take the lid off, and you get your kid's foot still attached to the kid. <laughs> and you, you press it into the clay, and you get this little footprint, you know. And then for years to come, you, you know, if you're feeling inclined, you remove the lid and you go, oh, look, there's this little footprint. And, it, and people buy stuff like that. It's like a photograph. It's, it captures this moment. And, and it's amazing how powerful things like that are, you know. I don't know, some of you, some of the younger people in the audience, maybe your parents still keep your little shoes from when you were tiny. You know, because <laughs> things like that matter. Okay, so Sony have been really getting their teeth into these ideas. Um, and of all the sectors you could think of, like high tech, it's got to be you know, one, of the, one of the really difficult areas to start talking about longer lasting products, you know, with the rapid pace of technological evolution. How on earth do you actually start to suggest alternatives to just more and more and more stuff? Um, but Sony are really interested in it. Um, and this is a quote from um, Emily Nickel, who's the general manager of sustainability at Sony. Um, and she says that we want our products to be emotionally engaging and deliver a rich experience over time. Designing emotional durability into products solders a formidable connection between brand and customer loyalty. So with that, I think you can start to, start to see that um, whilst we might also be talking about perhaps selling less hardware, you know, product, we're kind of selling something else. We're selling a, a value, we're selling a, an intimacy with a brand or a longer term relationship with a brand. And companies like Sony, you wouldn't believe the amount of money they spend through marketing and advertising and PR just trying to get people to feel closer to the brand. Because at some point, a person is gonna replace your product with another product. But the question is, well, whose product? Yours again, or someone else's, your competitor's product maybe. So what Sony are thinking is, well, okay, so instead of having a product that lasts 12 months, let's have a product that lasts 18 months. And when it does come to an end, our customers come back to us because they're more satisfied with what they had, and we start to build more of an, a lasting relationship with a customer. So instead of, instead of selling one product to them and then they vanish, we sell seven, but just over a much, much longer time frame. But also what Sony are talking about is this shift to cloud computing where we're saying, well, maybe the device is simply a way to communicate to people what's going on in the cloud. Um, and in that sense, most of the upgrades and innovation can take place through the software in the cloud. And the device is simply a way to give a language to that and make it usable. So it's just a slightly different shift in thinking. And it's a really exciting space because if Sony get behind it, then I'm guessing anybody can. Okay, so uh, two more slides and then I'm, and then I'm done. Um, I wanted to just, I suppose, reflect on something more broadly, which is that, you know, over the last 15 years, that's, you know, and I'm saying that because that's that's how long I think I've been involved in all of this, really. Um, over the last 15 years, I mean, sustainable business, as I see it, it's actually changed beyond recognition. And it's moved from a risk to an opportunity and from a compliance space to a leadership issue. And so what I mean by that is that once upon a time, Sustainability was this terrifying conversation that used to make everyone phone their lawyers up and get really, really nervous about. And I mean, it still is a bit like that, if you, you know, it can be. Uh, but what's happened is 
This situation has changed, so now in design, certainly, the sustainability space is seen as the single greatest opportunity that we have to rethink the way that we design the world around us. It's the best opportunity because what keeps a designer awake at night is actually the pressure and the anxiety of continually having to deliver cutting edge, fresh, different ideas. You know, that's, that's actually what creates the most stress. In a, in, in a, in a, in a designer's world, who's working at the, at the cutting edge of a brand who wants better, better, and continually better. You've got to deliver that. And what the sustainability paradigm does is it kind of presents you with this enormous palette of opportunities that weren't really there before. And you start dipping into that. And everything you do will feel different, it will feel fresh, and it will be challenging things from different angles. And those, if you can demonstrate those kinds of skills in your portfolio, you will get jobs and you'll get work because people who reinforce the status quo, are, they're dinosaurs. It's over. So finally, I haven't really talked a great deal about recycling and I haven't talked a great deal about climate change in fact, I haven't talked about those things at all. And the reason for that is that there are many different ways of engaging in the sustainability space, many different ways. And whilst it's important to have an understanding of the many different approaches you can take, it's also important to have a specialist approach which kind of really gives you drive and puts fire in your belly and you think, ah, that, I can do that. That's, that uses my skills and I understand that thing. Energy efficiency, I don't really get that. But when it comes to making people want certain things and not other things, yeah, I can do that. You know, that that's, that's what I can do. And so for me, when I'm consulting to businesses or uh, teaching on my MA at Brighton or wherever I am, it's about trying to present people with, I guess, a, a rich, palette of, of opportunities and inviting participation, you might look at all this and think, nah, that's not really for me. Fine. But it's very important to know what the options are. Very, very important. But no one is expecting you to be a master of everything because it's too big. Sustainability is like the ocean. You know, it's, it's everything. It's too big. So you need to start breaking it down and looking at particular areas that you can really specialize in and lead. That's my view. And if we follow that principle, then what we're doing is we're saying sustainability isn't this static field with four or five check boxes in it that you just need to check off and then that's it, job done. It's not that. It's a very dynamic, animated field which is continually being updated and refreshed with very radical thinking at all times. That's it, thank you. They do, yeah. I mean, a lot of the, certainly within the last six months, a lot of the work that I'm really starting to get into is uh, marketing and communication. Uh, and I'm working with some quite large kind of advertising and branding companies in, in London to say, well, how, how do we start to change this story and how do we help, help to tell a different story so that customers 
can actually understand why this is priced differently and why it kind of looks different and why you know why is why is it like that because i think if you can if you can get that message you know if you can plant that seed in people's minds so that they just get it then it changes everything because one of the frustrating things is that we can you know in design we can propose these fairly radical ideas but there's still that conceptual void between the design studio the marketing department and then the people roaming the high street or the the computer screen which is the high street you know there's still that gap you know and it's so it's a translation exercise as well like you just said you know Mm. What role do you see, what, what's the advice for designers out there who are trying to balance aesthetics with product technical usability and mm. Sure, yeah. I mean, design is always that tricky cocktail, isn't it, of these very technical, hard engineering aspects mixed with some more fuzzy aesthetic issues that are quite difficult to pin down, but they're there. Um, and really, the, what I'm talking about, I think it adds another layer to that. It doesn't necessarily replace anything that's there in terms of the dynamic of product design. I think it adds a, sli a slightly different agenda and layer. But I suppose my short answer would be that, um, and this is, this is not the academic in me talking, this is the design, uh, you know, this is more the designer I'm talking. It has to look cool, and it has to make people want it. Otherwise, there's no point. Yeah, um, I think we've had too many wasted years of people designing very well-intentioned, you know, humble things, which are right, which are very sustainable indeed, but they don't sell. In which case, they're not making a difference. Yeah, so I th that's that's why I think it's really healthy for from a personal point of view for me to work with people like Puma and. It's only because it, it, it reminds me that, yeah, this is, a, this is a real thing. This is commercial. And the more your products sell and support brands that are trying to make a difference, the more you are making a difference. Um, and I don't think that's a direct answer to your question. But I, but I do think that you know the idea of aesthetics, I think obviously a product, as it always does, it needs to give users clues as to what's going on. What am I supposed to do? That's, that hasn't changed. Um, but I think the story has changed slightly. Um, okay. I was just going to ask, you're consulting to Sony, I wrote this note. Um, how challenging is that when their concept of planned obsolescence is so critical to their sales? Yeah, um, well, they came to me, so it's kind of, it's, it's, what I mean by that is it's, I've got a captive audience. I think if I was standing outside with a placard, it would have been quite difficult to have the conversation. And I've, about 15 years ago, I used to do things like that. Uh, changed nothing. Um, but but what's, good about, what's good about, you know, Sony picking up these ideas and other, other companies is they're saying, well, we've got our core business. And then there's other stuff which is more peripheral. Um, and the stuff that's happening on the periphery is where we test and try things out. But the core business remains core until one of these peripheral ideas catches fire and really starts to take off. And then it moves central to the core. So at the moment, I think these ideas are seen as core ac uh, uh, peripheral activity, which doesn't mean it's not important. It means that it's just considered part of remaining healthy, fresh, and dynamic. And like I used Darwin before, it's like that, you know, if it, if it thrives, then let's keep feeding it and doing more. If it doesn't, then maybe we'll go talk to someone else about something else. Yeah, and, it, and it's great. People are prepared to just give it a shot like that. Yeah, it, it also means it's a lower risk uh, opportunity, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I've lost track of who was first, I'm afraid. Mm. Is 
for what? Sustainable design. It's going gonna, it's gonna to climb and climb over the next, I guess, five to ten years until it becomes so normal that we don't talk about it anymore. Mm. 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 Um, but I'm curious if you your take on the balance between um, packaging and presentation and sustainability because packaging most of the time is just disposable, if not recyclable. Yeah. Well, I suppose it is. Um, I suppose my, pitch, my position is to agree with you entirely uh, in that, yes, it is. It's, packaging is, uh, is, is very important in one sense. It has a very functional, practical uh, side to it, of course, you know, for shipping and storage of products uh, and, and, and point of sale and those kinds of things. But yeah, I agree that um, it's limited. I mean, one, one thing that uh, uh, there's, there's so much opportunity, though, in packaging to start to play with the way people think about what it is, you know, secondary use packaging and, uh, and, and ways of having packaging which can be broken down to create new products out of it. And I know I keep going on about children, but there's some interesting shoe packaging that's coming out, which is, um, you know, uh, grown-up shoes, uh, but where the packaging uh, can be cut along certain lines to create model dinosaurs and different toys and things like that, which normally a person would go and buy. You know, so there's all kinds of opportunities to kind of build other lives into pack packaging. But yeah, I agree. It's a it's a it's a strange phenomenon, isn't it? Packaging, how we've created this field uh, through necessity, but it also becomes a, a kind of product design in its own right. Yeah, it's tricky. We'll have a round table with a session at lunch on packaging. That's one of the mm. things we'll talk about mm. eating around. What we're going to call it is tabletop mm. is packaging mm. today. Mm. Well, there's, a, there's a question here, and then I'm around all day anyway, so. Yeah. Oh, yes. And that's something that we're, we're, you're going to get to, uh, we're going to get to interact with you even more thoroughly, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and in that workshop, we're, we're going to design an emotionally durable chair together. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Do, do you want to ask a question? Well, Yeah, yeah. I mean, that story of evolution is, is quite central. And uh, again, it's, I, I didn't talk about it because of time, but just to touch on it lightly, I mean, since, since the dawn of, of our species, we have, um, where there's been some enduring characteristics of the human condition, which is to continually be curious about new things. And if you remember that a couple of millennia ago, the world was a, a, a misunderstood and unexplained place. When there was thunder and lightning, we assumed somebody was pissed off at us. Something had happened. Uh, today, um, conventional reality comes with the majority of problems already solved and explained. And so that kind of quota within us for mystery and uh, curiosity and, and what, we, what we, you know, newness, newness, new experiences, that is now wanting uh, because because there's nothing to be curious about, not so much. Also what's happened is, um, whereas once upon a time we may have applied our hunger for new experiences, we may have applied that to new stories, different forms of folklore, friendships, and those kinds of non-physical things, and they would have stimulated us and kept us satisfied. Somewhere, in the last two or three hundred years, we've replaced that with a hunger for material things. So we consume and experience newness, not through each other and through the sky and through stories, but through toasters, microwaves, jackets, and chairs and things. You know? And that's a gross simplification, but 
it does show that actually this thing that's motivating and driving us has always been there. It's just mutated into something else. So that's another reason why it's quite a dangerous thing to just ask people to stop consuming because you're essentially asking them to stop being human. <laughs> but what they're consuming, that's a different idea. That's a different story. And I think the, to have products which evolve and change and adapt, it means that we've bought one object, but we're consuming lots of different experiences through it. That, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, how we can start to subvert it and work with it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. We're going to look forward to more conversations with you, Jonathan, throughout the day. Um, and next, we're going to hear from at the home furnishings industries, one of our most loved brands is Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams, one of the most durable, um, emotionally durable design companies in this industry. So Mitchell, do come on up and um, uh, let me introduce you. Mitchell is a co-founder and the chairman of Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams, which is a rather different kind of business. And Mitchell is a rather different kind of guy in the way that he runs his business and lives his life. He is completely committed to making a difference. And one way he makes a difference is by serving on the Sustainable Furnishings Council board and being one of our design and green leaders. Um, and I, I just am, I love this pairing of your following Jonathan because this company is a design driven company and they are well loved designs and it all comes I think from the chairman's willingness to live in integrity, wear your beliefs on your chest, as it says on the bio, if I were reading it. So thank you very much for being here, Mitchell, and for the uh, difference that you make and all that you're about to share with us now in this next half hour or so. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Susan. Well, let me get technologically correct. Here we go. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Just so that I can get an understanding of kind of who's here and why, how many here are students? Good amount, good. And are you uh, involved in the home furnish, the study of home furnishings or design or sustainability? Just yell it out. So sustainability in anything. It could be waste management. Uh, kinds of things, as well as product design, perhaps. And those that are not students, are you business people in the home furnishings industry? Maybe raise your hand. Excellent. Well, I um, want to start by saying that, uh, well, let me ask this question. How many people have no idea who I am and what my furniture looks like? Be honest. OK. <laughs> just, I, just, I, I did that because. So let me, let me introduce uh, myself sitting on the chair. And, I, and my title is Chair-Man, uh, because uh, when I became chairman of the company, I didn't want to have the chairman tell it, and I didn't want to be called a chairperson or a chair human being. And our marketing guy came up with the idea of Chair-Man, because we started making chairs. And almost 25 years ago, next year, my uh, then partner, partner in life, uh, and I decided we would start a business together. And I was really incredibly fortunate, and I tell us, especially to young people starting out, that if you're going to get into a business and have a partnership, uh, choosing that partner is really important. And having the right synergy with that partner who, wants, who has the same uh, vision and ideals and concept of integrity and the way you want to run business and run your life is really important. And uh, to use an expression I learned when I moved down south, I couldn't be more blessed than to have Bob as my partner. Um, I mean, somewhere from the heavens, I got this guy who really, he and I got along so well and built the business together. Uh, 
we gave birth to an English bulldog uh, <laughs> who unfortunately is resting in peace after 12 and a half great years, but she had a, a big impact on our business and our marketing and the way we did things. Uh, from, we got her on a Monday night, on a Tuesday morning at eight weeks old. We brought her to work and told all of our employees that she would be there every day. And the only rule was no people food for her. And we kept her healthy for 12 and a half years, which is long for an English bulldog. Uh, but she was really a fun part of life because it does give you, in an everyday business environment, uh, when you look at her and smell her or hear her, it really makes you, it kind of brings you down to earth and, and really brings a uh, humanness through a dog to your business. Uh, but Bob and I, uh, we started our business, as I said, almost 25 years ago. And we decided that we would go into the furniture business. I had worked for a big furniture company um, that actually uh, was a really great experience because I learned a lot of things to do, and I learned a lot of things not to do. And I will always remember the chairman of the company one day saying to me, and I usually go by Mitchell, except for my mother and a couple of other people. I uh, don't like it that much when people call me Mitch, but I especially don't like when they go, Mitch. Um, <laughs> this is a profit-driven company. And I just thought to myself, gosh, an idiot knows a company is a profit-driven company, but what else is a company? What other juices does a company have to really keep it going and to make it worthwhile and to make it have its place in society? And um, I hate to say it, but just this past week, that company who I left, um, they went chapter 11. And I'll tell you, the, the part, a big part of the reason, I think, is because they, they didn't have much besides an understanding of how to make money. And in today's world, to survive, I think, you really have to know a lot more than just how to make money. And when uh, Bob and I started the business of making upholstered dining chairs, and uh, the various furniture that we were making, uh, we just evolved a style sense. So I wanted just to show you a couple pictures of the kinds of furniture that we make, but we're in the home furnishings business. We make the sofas, the tables, the lamps, and the accessories, the pillows, the mirror. Uh, we just don't build the house that it goes in. Uh, but our sense of style is very much takes its cue from mid-century modern. And part of the reason that that really uh, works for us or that we, we kind of gravitated to it is because a lot of people are moving into mid-century modern homes. If you look at a city, uh, there'll be the downtown area and then the immediate suburbs where people first started moving in the 50s and 60s were these immediate suburbs to a city. And then as time went on, people started moving further out and now we have people moving back to those areas. And it's a, uh, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the younger 20, 30-year-olds are moving back to that area and rejuvenating those areas. And Bob had the vision to say, well, what kinds of furniture are people going to want to have in those places? So we gravitated to mid-century modern. Uh, but we do a lot of things with a more traditional feel to the modernism. And then we do a lot of things that have a real modern feel to the, the modern design. Uh, but when we started almost 25 years ago, about a month after we started our business, I was in New York and picked up the New York Times, and on the lower left corner of the front page, there was an article about the environment and how the ozone layer was being depleted. And I read this article, and towards the end of it, it said that one of the biggest abusers of the environment was the furniture industry. And in those days, I ran to a telephone booth and took out my credit card at a phone booth. And I called Bob and I said, you're not going to believe this, but we are in a business. We're starting a business that's one of the biggest abusers of the environment. And it's this foam that we use that's such a big part of our product. It emits CFCs in the air, and that's part of what deteriorates the ozone layer. Now, trust me when I tell you, I had no idea what all this stuff meant. Um, I really... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not that scientifically oriented, but when I read that, it really hit me of a reminder of when I flew into Los Angeles some years ago. And this is what you saw when you flew into Los Angeles uh, 
25, 30, 40 years ago. There was a lot of smog, a lot of pollution, and um, you know, you don't have to be that smart to figure it out, but you just see something like that and you have to ask yourself, is this the kind of world that I want to live in? And, and it's not. Um, so that became a beginning point for us to say, how can we build our business? How can we have our business so that it is environmentally responsible? And incredibly, I mean, I, I think when I, when I think back to the history of our business, there's so much luck involved, but there's also so much persistence and determination. Uh, and we set out to go to every foam manufacturer and find out how exactly they were manufacturing their product. And incredibly, there was a manufacturer that had just come out with a new product that was water-based and didn't emit CFCs in the air. And we, we grabbed onto it. And they, they were so excited because they had been trying to sell this to some furniture manufacturers. And of course, in our industry of dinosaurs, uh, they were just like totally uninterested, and they were particularly uninterested because it was a little more expensive. It wasn't a lot more expensive, but it was a little more expensive. And uh, so we, we started using that foam. And that kind of gave us the real bug about it. And we started looking at our packaging. We started looking at uh, the waste that we were generating within the company. We started looking at our energy usage, our electricity, and all of the various things. And we kind of got on the whole recycling kick uh, because we realized how important it was to protect our environment. So from an early point, we've, we said to ourselves, you know, we've got to figure this out. How can we have a business that's responsible to the community? Now, we live in an area. Th this is a um, part of research that was done last year. And just to be fully honest, because Susan's sitting up front, I had this whole, I had my whole PowerPoint prepared and like Tuesday of this week, uh, my computer came on and said, you know, that it was going to shut down to re, you know, update some things and stuff and I didn't pay attention to it. So I lost my whole presentation and my notes, but I reconstructed it this morning, but I had to use the, the study from last year. So I'm going to use uh, some information from a study last year, but it's not dissimilar to the newest study we've done. And the newest study we've done has showed uh, progress in most areas. But what's interesting about this map is it shows you um, the, this is the, the, the areas that are more likely to be uh, interested in, in going green and in, in being uh, responsible to the environment. So as you can see, in the Northeast, it's about 50% of people, and in the West, 50% of people. And then you get down to, uh, then you get up to the Midwest, and it's around 37%. And you get to the Southeast, and it's 44%. And then you get down to uh, the Texas area, and it's 31%. And I'm going to be really open and honest, and I hope I don't insult anybody, but rather if, I, if you are of this belief system, then maybe uh, you can gain a little more information and knowledge from it. But there is a direct link between uh, people who believe that they really don't have to worry about the environment, that God's going to take care of it, and um, people who don't really feel that they want to invest much in politicians or in programs or in regulations that protect the environment. And, you know, I take this really seriously because my factory is in Taylorsville, which is about an hour and a half from here. Uh, it's in a county of uh, 38,000 people. It's beautiful rolling mountains. There are 14 traffic lights. Uh, dozens, it's a dry county, no alcohol is served, and 135 churches, 124 of which are Southern Baptist. And I have employees that truly say things like, well, none of it really matters. And in fact, somebody the other day said, they're talking about Syria, and I overheard them, and they said, well, none of it really matters because the world is coming to an end soon, and we'll have peace for three days before the Savior comes back, or something to that extent. But I have to tell you, people really believe this way. And part of what all of us have to do is break that barrier of, I don't want to call it ignorance, but lack of knowledge and fear, and break that barrier and learn how to talk to people so that we communicate and get people to understand that, that, uh, that God is here to help us, perhaps, but we have to help ourselves also.
And uh, I always remember uh, some years ago, I was with a Methodist minister friend of mine, and somebody said to him something like, well, you know, the next generation is getting better, and things are really getting better. And he said, it's only going to get better if we participate in helping people to get better, if we take the leadership position and we talk to people about it. So I take it really seriously um, to talk to folks that have this kind of belief system, because I also believe that if you look at American politics, these folks um, have an incredible influence on what happens. They have an incredible influence on Republican primaries. They have an incredible influence on the national platforms of the Republican Party. Now, I'll talk about Republicans and Democrats. The, Republi you know, the Republicans I've just mentioned, they're lacking this, and the Democrats don't have a backbone to really stand up and take advantage of some of these opportunities also. So let me just go to politics for a moment and say to you that during the Republican primaries, you'll remember that Rick Santorum said it was a hoax, this whole, uh, you know, this whole climate change thing. He said it was a hoax. So this is a hoax? This, this is, you know, finally when people in Los Angeles couldn't see that clear anymore and didn't like the smell anymore and they realized it's not a hoax, they started doing something about it. Um, Chris Christie, Republican governor of New Jersey, big, strong, tough guy, you know, really talks tough to the press, really kind of a bullyish kind of guy. He doesn't have the backbone in the face of Hurricane Sandy to stand up and say, you know what, there's a climate change problem and we, Republicans and Democrats and all Americans, have to do something about it. Instead, knowing that he possibly is going to run for president, he sheepishly starts talking about, well, you know, we have to build stronger buildings or we have to do things to be able to withstand climate change. I mean, it's really quite idiotic. And only to be outdone by, we have this disaster of a BP oil spill and President Obama, who has this moment of opportunity to really stand up and say, okay, everybody, now we really have to do something about climate change, he recoils and doesn't really take the leadership position and do it. So I have plenty of ill comments to say about Republicans and Democrats alike, but at the end of the day, all of us have to take those positions and stand and say something about it. So when we see a map like this, you know, I'm not at all happy that it's 50%, but the good news is it doesn't take a lot of people to make change. And if you have a loud and a smart and, and, and an articulate group of people that are in that 50% who understand the problem and want to do something about it, we can make progress. And we can make progress even in the 31 and 44% of the uh, opportunities. You know, what's interesting in the 31% area, I just bought an electric car, uh, a Tesla, uh, because I could save so much money on gas that I just had to go out and spend all that money for car. But anyway, that's the benefit of having a, a good furniture business. Uh, but what was interesting to me is down in Houston, Texas, which is you know, the oil capital of the energy capital of America, I was dazzled by how many Teslas and Priuses I saw there. So even these folks down there who elected Rick Perry as their governor, uh, but they did elect a gay mayor, a mayor in East Parker, um, and this, this crazy dichotomy of progressive and very unprogressive things. But there, but there are people everywhere who understand the problem and want to build a better country. Uh, so there's hope everywhere. Uh, you know, it's interesting being an alum be in, at Elam because I think many of you know, I mean, this is a university that does polling that's really nationally famous. Do you all, under do you all realize that, that the polling work that's done here is really looked at nationally and it, it really has a great deal of credibility? And I'm really proud of North Carolina because we have Elam polling and there's an organization out of Raleigh named PPP, Public Policy Polling, and they were cited by the Wall Street Journal as the second most accurate polling company organization uh, during the past two election cycles. So we've got some really good energy here and smarts. Uh, but, but I say that to you because in the survey that we did, we were asking the question, uh, would you basically, would you be willing to pay more for uh, a product that's, that's a green product? And you see that, um, you know, there's a certain percentage that said nothing more 
Um, then there's a percentage that say up to 5% more. And there's a perception by people that it will probably cost more. So what I want to just talk for a minute about is it does cost more for us to manufacture products in an environmentally responsible manner. And it does save us money to run our factory and make product in an environmentally responsible way. And when you put both of them together, it's the expense, the additional expense is marginally more. So for example, uh, when we cut fabric, we have fabric waste. And 20 years ago, in, in the early parts of our business, you would have that fabric waste and you would put it into bags and throw it in the landfill. Today, we put that together, we sell it, sell it, make money uh, to an org a company that takes it and recycles it and makes other products with it. Uh, the leather that we cut and used to waste, we sell to a company that takes it and makes anything from key fobs to ugly patchwork pocketbooks. Um, we had, you know, you know those pocketbooks I'm talking about. Um, we have frames, our, our wood frames. It used to be, I used to just go completely crazy about this, but we would discontinue a style. We'd have 20 or 30 frames left. But the way that our system was, <coughs> excuse me, they, these frames were all constructed, and so we had to take those frames to the landfill. And we had to pay to throw these things in the garbage. And I got with my team after one time some years ago, and I said, there has to be a better way. We have to figure it out, uh, short of us going in the frame building business, because that's a whole other process in a factory, and it creates a lot of dust that I'm a little allergic to. But anyway. Uh, but we came up with a way to work with our frame suppliers so that we could create a whole just-in-time process. So instead of us having to go buy a minimum of 50 built frames in the past, or 75 or 100, depending on what we were buying, now we can literally call up on Monday and say we need six of this and 12 of that and 18 of this and two of that, and by the following week we have it in our factory. So in an effort to cut down on our expense and and the horrors that a landfill causes, we were able to make something less expensive. And finally, I'll tell you that one of our most recent things, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided that we really wanted to cut down on our energy usage. So we uh, started wanting to, we wanted to turn the lights out in the factory during uh, lunchtime. And we thought that our employees would get really upset about it because, I don't know, we just thought they would. And what happened was the employees love it because they, Many of them in the factory bring a lunch, they eat for a few minutes, and then they take a little nap. Well, which would you rather do, take a nap when it's dark or light? So energy helping things really, uh, you know, th these are all things that can really save money for a business if you are dedicated to the idea that you want to do something better, that you ultimately want to do the right thing. So I just want to go back to this and say that um, the other interesting thing about this is when you ask people, would you be willing to pay more for a product if it was environmentally responsible, I believe in interpreting statistics, um, the instinct of people is to always say they don't want to pay more for anything. And you know, the example I'll use is uh, I get a lot, after staying in a hotel, I get a lot of surveys of how did you like the hotel? How did you like the service? How did you like the sheets? How did you like the decor? Blah, blah, blah. And you know, did you feel the price was fair? Well, heck, I don't want to say the price was fair. I don't want them to feel that they can charge me more. So I always say it's too expensive. And I think most people do that. Uh, so I think we have to be careful when we ask, will you pay more for a product? The other thing that's interesting, uh, in our most recent survey, we found out that like 60 or 70% of people recycle. 60 or 70% of people now recycle. They buy uh, recycled towel, you know, paper towels, they buy recycled uh, paper cups, they buy light energy saving light bulbs. So they are buying products that are a little more expensive uh, when they get on that grocery aisle uh, because they want to do things that are environmentally responsible. And I believe the same thing is in home furnishings, that they'll, that, that they'll pay a little more, but I don't think we have to tell them that they're paying a little more. I think we have to put out a product, be proud of the price, and ultimately, 
you know, in, in our business, we make sofas that are $1,400, $1,700, $2,200. Whether somebody's paying $1,700 for a sofa or $1,600 for a sofa, I don't have to tell them that it's $1,700 instead of 1600 because of how of the materials we're using. I just have to tell them the darn thing is beautiful, it's comfortable, and I'm trying to think of the word again, it's durable design, emotionally durable design, because I wanted to pick up on that comment. I didn't want to forget. The thing I love about my partner, Bob, um, he wants, he's, he's, he heads up the design part of our business. He doesn't want to design a product that will break, that will go out of fashion. He wants to design a product that people will love and hold on to forever. Now, in that foreverness, they might move it to a second home and, or a third home, or they might give it to a child, or they might do, they might pass it on uh, because they might get bored with the product at some point or change homes and it doesn't fit anymore. But I really believe that in building a business, if you start from, from the pit of your stomach, from the idea of I'm going to do right by people, I don't want somebody to buy our product and have it be obsolete in seven or eight or 10 years. And I will tell you, there's a gazillion furniture companies, especially the one that just went chapter 11. We used to have meetings and they used to talk about how they would only make it up to a certain point so that people would have to, have to re redo and get something else again. So I think it's really important that uh, people do, are able to buy a design that will last and that they will have an attachment to. And here you're seeing uh, people are saying that, you know, what's the most important factor in when you buy a product? It's quality, comfort, blah, blah, blah. And eco-friendly is, you know, down at the bottom. But I think this is just like in North Carolina when polling was done and people were asked, you know, what are your important um, things to vote for? It's the economy, it's jobs, it's the economy, it's jobs. And whether or not two men or two women get married is way down and not all that important. But the truth is, for a certain amount of population in this state, it was a critically important thing. It was a decision-making thing in the people they vote for. And it's a, it was a decision-making thing in motivating them to go to the polls to vote for discriminatory legislation. But I use that in the same context that people that are interested in the environment, that are a little bit sensitive to it, when they can buy a product that is this sofa for X amount of dollars and a similar sofa for X amount of dollars, and one is made by an environmentally responsible company, I am here to tell you they will buy the product more often than not from the company that's environmentally responsible because that is, it's not just become fashionable in America, it's part of pop culture now. And it's part of it, not because it's cool and hip and stuff like that, it's because people have eyes and they can see that it is important to be involved in the environment and to understand it. And people want to have a clean city versus a dirty city. And there's all kinds of things that contribute uh, to environmental problems, but to me this is the most easy, visible thing for those old enough to remember what it used to be like to go to Los Angeles or to New York. And just as a reminder, that's what Los Angeles used to look like on a flight, and this is what it looks like today. Not perfect, but getting better, and we all have a lot of work to do. So as you said, Jonathan, I thought you were terrific. That's it. <laughs> Okay. We have time for a few questions. Is, uh, do we have like a couple of questions sure. you can take? But I, just before I take a question, I just do yeah. want to say, Jonathan, I loved your talk. And it was so on target for, you know, what's inside of me and how we've run our business without even thinking about it. And I appreciated that you put it up for words. Thank you. Yeah. So any, any questions? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Well, it was a, an emotional problem for me when Lulu passed away. And, I, and I've had dogs for a long time, and I'm pet free right now. Um, but Bob and I also lost our certain emotional attachment about 10 years ago. So he's living with his partner, Stephen, and they have two French bulldogs, and I'm the proud uncle of them, and I get to see them and love them. But I also travel too much, so it's really hard for me to uh, do that. One of the uh, things that I didn't read in your bio 
bio is um, that you are you were from New Jersey. Right, and, right. Um, but you live here in North Carolina now in Taylorsville, and you live there with your spouse, Tim. Right. And y'all, I think, already lived in Taylorsville when you got married in another In state. Des Moines, Iowa. Um, in, and the news ran in the New York Times Society page first, uh, um, right. sex marriage on the right. Society page, and in the Taylorsville Times, <laughs> which is found. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you that when we got married, we decided to get married in Des Moines because it was middle of America, and I thought there was a chance that it might be written about, so I would rather it be written that I got married in Des Moines, Iowa, in the middle of America, than a northeastern liberal state. And it wasn't the Taylorsville Times, it was the Hickory Daily Record okay, okay. did a front page story, and uh, it was really great because there's a lot of good people out there. Yeah. But Google Mitchell Gold Wedding and see the New York Times article, it's pretty fabulous. Yes, it was great. <laughs> Any other questions, ma'am? Well, I unfortunately totally think that's accurate. I think that the lower income it relates to lower education level often. When you, get, when you really are getting down to kind of uh, serious Walmart and Kmart shopping. Uh, but even those places are starting to, you're, you're seeing more and more environmental things. Um, but I think there are people, let's, let's call it middle income people, maybe, that um, you know, might not be buying our product, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, part, part of what we do in our store, when somebody comes in and says, you know, I have a favorite sofa that my grandmother gave me, we don't try to sell them a new sofa. We try to sell them other things to go with it and make it fit within their plan. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not trying to get somebody to throw away something that's important to them. Um, but I think there's definitely, uh, that, that, that definitely on, but I, I would say, you know, at the very, very high level of income, the half of 1%, they don't give a crap. And those people are abusing things all over the place. Uh, but then you get another level down that people are becoming more and more conscious of it. Um, but I think there is definitely a link to that. Yes. The, one of the things that our um, this year survey shows, and Robin might speak to this some, um, we did survey a wider range of income, so we're going to have more mm -hmm. trending data on that. More people are more willing to pay more. They are paying for what matters to them. And that, as you say, is the way the thing looks. They're paying for yeah. a design at any price point. Um, and then they're paying for the favorite brand or what matters to them. And eco-friendly does fit right in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, well we, we are members of the Sustainable Furnishings Council, and there are metrics within there. Uh, there's, there's levels of um, exemplary. exemplary, I'm sorry. There's exemplary recognition. Um, we had a big meeting on this yesterday. It's almost impossible to reach the top level. Uh, there's bronze, gold. Bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And we and a few others have reached the second level. Um, and it's hard to get to that level. And it, the reality is to really be totally environmentally responsible, you have to have a business that basically buys and sells within a 500 mile radius of your business. Uh, but to have a more global business like we do, it's really tough. Uh, but we work on it all the time. And um, 
we, we, we buy wood that's certified and, you know, that kind of stuff. Because you, you have to make sure that you understand where it comes from. And that's, that's part of an additional expense. I, th I think it's growing. Yeah, I, well, I, th I think it's growing. And, you know, in, in, in my situation, we are a manufacturer and a retailer. So in our manufacturing business, we're putting more emphasis uh, on, on our suppliers of what kind of practices that they have. And I was just uh, uh, visiting one of our retail customers, and I had a can of Diet Coke, and I said, you know, where's your recycling? And they didn't have it. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like page one of the manual. So it turns out that they had to get to the mall management, and now I got to the mall ownership. And, you know, there, there's... So, so to that level, you know, we are pushing it. But I must tell you, there's a lot of other places that they're already doing a lot of these things. I just had a supplier yesterday that I wrote to one of our suppliers because it made me think of it in our meeting. And I said, you know, you're not members of Sustainable Furnishings Council, but more importantly, you're not, you're not trying to get to any of these exemplary levels and stuff like that. And uh, so I started talking to him. And I said, you know, I, I don't know if I could buy your product based on the way you're operating at this point. But I based on what kind of certifications and metrics you're looking at, uh, but I know that they're a good company. So it's not that far for them to really start focusing on a few of these things. Some of it looks so big and complicated, but if you just start at number one, number two, and just keep chewing away at it, it's not as complicated. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mitchell. Now I have the great privilege of introducing Robin. Uh, Robin Wilson is, uh, you have probably seen her on the news and you've probably seen her at the back of the room with her sweet little daughter walking around. Robin is nationally recognized as an eco-friendly and healthy space interior designer. One of the things that we know is that most consumers come to a concern about sustainability issues because somebody at their house is sick and they frequently go seeking the services of an interior designer designer who can help them with that. Robin is such a designer. She's an expert focused on allergy and asthma related issues and indoor air quality. And she does work with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And she too is on the board of Sustainable Furnishings Council for which you thank you very much and for your work as a designing green leader for us. Um, and, and so um, let's see, I want to be sure we are happily queued up here because I know there are a couple of different um, sets of presentations, but y'all are all happily queued up. So I am going to hand it over to Robin Wilson, who is going to fill in any gaps about what she wants you to know about her as well as her message. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a one-year-old, so I did not have a chance to really practice this speech last night, so bear with me. I didn't sleep either. Um, <laughs> uh, today, this is a continuing education unit yes. segment, and so unfortunately, I can't speak like I normally do, which is to wander the room and really get dynamic, because there's some very key points I have to cover, otherwise you can't get the credit. So the very beginning of the presentation will be um, what I call very static, and I will have to stay here and go through those points. After um, the presentation, if you are a designer or a professional in the industry, you can speak to Susan and and Janet, and they will give you continuing education credits for this um, particular event. So hopefully, okay, yes. Uh, well, you can hear her out there screaming. So um, in any case, um, so bear with me while I go through the first 10 to 15 minutes. It's not going to be exciting, but it's very important. It will be very exciting. Um, it will be, um, but it's very important that I cover these points. Otherwise, you can't get the credit. So the first thing I want to tell you is thank you for coming out to this 12th annual forum here at Elon University. Um, I would like to discuss today the reality of marketing sustainability, both from a consumer perspective and from a branding perspective. 
My firm, Robin Wilson Home, was actually founded in 2000. And here we are 13 years later, considered at the forefront of eco-friendly design, uh, health, wellness, and sustainability. I'm going to share with you a very confidential branding proposal, especially if you're in the business or you want to be in the interior design business. You need to know which brand silo you fit into. And this will help give you some guide points to do that. Um, I always, again, start with statistics. And then I give you a story that you're going to remember long after this presentation. The key to understanding, and I always say eco-friendly, not green, uh, because green is a marketing term that I think is old, it's tired, and people um, are greenwashing today with things like green yachts and green sports cars. Um, it's just an oxymoron. So the spending power of this consumer is a billion, multi-billion dollar business with a 20% year-over-year growth component. The consumer is typically an aspirational buyer, and the market itself has a 68% upside with the existing consumer base, but there are 88% of consumers who could be consumers you approach in this space. The SFC has research that we're going to share this morning, and it is basically geared to help consumers become more aware of the toxicity in our home environments, in the global environment, and more importantly, to help people become environmental aware of the environmental companies that they should be supporting in their businesses. They do believe that global warming or climate change is a real issue, and they want people to be more and more aware of that. There are things that we're going to take away from the research today. Um, by the way, this is the fifth annual survey that they have done, and it was sponsored by Mitchell Gold. 300 plus of these consumers are women. I think that's really important. They're age 30 to 50, and they are typically with a household income of 50% or more, and they purchase $500 or more in home furnishings. As you see, eco-friendly is the number one term preferred by this consumer. On a scale of awareness, I'm sorry, I thought this would just all pop up uh, very easily, toxic pollutants, is the number one key. Now, I have a new baby. So what's the key that I'm learning in every mommy group? Is this going to harm my baby? Is this going to harm my child? And also my pet. And that's another concern for a lot of people. So when you're talking to consumers as a designer, or if you go into design, you need to be prepared to tell them there's no formaldehyde, for example, in the furniture adhesives. You need to tell them that the chemicals in the foam aren't going to off-gas and harm their family. This is Susan's research, unfortunately. And I'm going to tell you, you will be able to look at that research on her website. It does explain it. I'm just giving an overview um, because I only have 10 minutes to do the overview and then I have to go into my actual presentation. So, so the research yep. is available to Sustainable Furnishings Council members as part of your dues. Of, uh, and uh, uh, anybody can buy it at the Impact Consulting website. They are who did the research. Um, scale, you ask somebody to rate your concern about different issues on a seven point scale from not at all interested to quite interested and um, we find that it's about 75% of consumers who are fairly evenly concerned about all sustainability issues, that list of issues we gave them. They're concerned about all of it. Thank you. Okay, someone's taking an iPhone picture, so I'll leave it up for just a second. You got it? All right, perfect. All right, so this consumer, they know a little, but they're not doing too much. And that means they go into a store like a Mitchell Gold, and they know a little bit about eco-friendly design. They know that they want something that's healthy for their family, but they go to the sales clerk and they say, what should I get? And, or they don't say anything other than, well, I'm interested in eco-friendly design, but what's the price point? So we'll get to that in just a second. If someone has asthma or allergies, if someone has cancer, they do care. I'm actually an ambassador also for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and I'm gonna give you some statistics that are gonna shock you. One in four children suffers from allergies. One in six suffers from asthma, and one in nine suffers from both. Now, that's, that's an epidemic as far as I'm concerned. Now, I was one of those kids that 
had asthma and allergies. So I was a strange kid that, you know, couldn't eat grilled cheese sandwiches or, you know, maybe I was allergic to dogs and I couldn't go to someone's house. That is an epidemic today where you're seeing children have anaphylactic reactions just because peanuts or peanut butter was served in the cafeteria. So there's a toxin, a toxicity that is also being, um, how do you say, more of an issue with homes with paint that is perhaps off-gassing and the child walks in, they have an asthma reaction or um, toxins in the carpeting. So we have to be concerned. And that's something, again, I will talk about in my presentation, but I'm presenting the facts for SFC. The easiest change most people can make at their home is recycling. That's the simple, easy one. If someone wants to take a slip photo of this slide, I'll leave it up for one second. Um, the hardest thing for most people is purchasing organic food because it's more expensive. I've actually heard the nickname, instead of Whole Foods, they say Whole Paycheck. And I'm from Austin, Texas. I remember when Whole Foods was a co-op and people went and they volunteered for a couple of hours and they got discounted food and now it truly is a corporate uh, corporation. Green products that are purchased, typically the easiest thing is light bulbs. You he hear about CFLs, you hear about LED light bulbs, and it price range from $6 to $24. That's an easy purchase. But let me give you another couple of eco-friendly products. Again, I don't use the term green. Nylon shower curtains. Did you know that a vinyl shower curtain will disrupt the endocrine system of your child? And it will also, it, the American Medical Association just came out with a study showing that it can affect women's fertility. Do you know that I didn't believe that? <laughs> and I got rid of my vinyl shower curtain and three months later, she was on the way. It's that simple. Simple steps can change your life. And we can talk all day and preach and scare people and say, oh, if you have a vinyl back carpet, you're gonna die. Yes, you will have off-gassing, you won't die, but if you have 60 things that are in your house that are off-gassing, and we all love that new car smell, well, that's what off-gassing is. It's the toxic chemical smells from man-made materials, whether glues, and other, other chemicals, paints, et cetera, and that new car smell, we all love that, right? Well, you don't really love it for your body. You want to roll the windows down and get that out of your car. People are not aware of, these are some statistics. Why are they not purchasing them? If you go across the board, in 2008, they weren't aware of any. In 2013, they now say that they're not aware again. <laughs> but the reality is, the furnishings industry, for example, has be it's become ubiquitous to have eco-friendly or green materials. So they may say they're not aware, but they could actually be purchasing it and not being aware that they're purchasing it. I think that's a simple way to read this slide. Ninety percent of the people that I work with in my design business think that it will cost more to buy eco-friendly materials. Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I have a Prius. A Prius might cost more than a regular uh, small compact car. But guess what? I fill up maybe once a month, so it really doesn't cost more in the long term. If it's about your health, it doesn't cost more. That's the way to look at it. Options in green, for, in green home furnishings that we've heard of, and I think what we should be really saying is words that we've heard of related to eco-friendly practices. Energy Star uh, is the number one. In fact, my very first boss helped create the Energy Star program, and we've all heard of that. Have you heard of WaterSense? Kohler, um, started a program, and WaterSense is another one that's becoming more ubiquitous. Again, you might say, I don't have any green home furnishings. Well, if you have a Kohler faucet, sink, tub, or toilet in your house, you have an energy or eco-friendly product in your home because they practice WaterSense practices. If you have an appliance that's Energy Star rated, you are doing eco-friendly practices in your home. I told y'all this part was dry, y'all, so please don't leave me. <laughs> um, over 40% of people are likely to do green home furnishings. They're likely to invest in FSC or certified hardwoods, but they say that they aren't willing to pay more. Well, the reality is they do. They just don't know sometimes that they are doing so. And I've got one more slide, I think. Oh, Yeah, this is the last one. Okay. This is the difference between the numbers that Mitchell was talking about and the numbers this year. So just on the right.
This is your research this year. The changes. Concern is up. There are uh, yeah. more people have bought eco-friendly products. Um, so yes. awareness is up. More people say they'll pay more out. Right. So in simple terms, this again is the last bit for the CEU credit. <laughs> in simple terms. The aspirational consumer is likely to be interested in eco-friendly design. They're also likely to define sustainability with the terms green, although we suggest eco-friendly if you're in the design business. The consumer wants a quality product that's durable and affordable, and they like to tell their friends that they're being sustainable. They like to have a dinner party and say, oh, I'm recycling, I'm doing all these great things, and they like to show it with possibly driving a hybrid car. So that's the consumer you're going after if you're a designer. And you're not trying to preach to them. You're trying to brand a company that you work with. You're trying to define what eco-friendly is. And you're trying to market to them. If you preach to them and say you're going to die if you don't buy this, they're going to be turned off and they won't be interested. That is the summary of the continuing education credit part. Now I'm starting my presentation. OK. Robin Wilson arrives. Um, OK, taking you in a different direction. Um, and I'm so sorry. That's the dry part, but we have to get through that. I started my firm in 2000, and we were initially focused on project management. And then we moved into design. I have all these crazy clients, Wall Streeters, who would fly me out to the Hamptons on their helicopter, and they would say, hey, Robin, just I don't have a budget. This is before 2008, but mind you. And uh, they would say, just I need you to fix my house up. I've got a house in Aspen. I've got a house in the Hamptons. I've got a house in the Caribbean. And I need you also to do my Park Avenue apartment. And so literally, they had no budget. It was. It, I'm from Texas, from Austin, and I grew up, my dad was a bus driver, you know, so I was just like, you have no budget? Okay. So we would go to places like ABC Carpet and Home, the most expensive place. We'd go to Mitchell's store, and they'd be like, I want this, 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 and this. And in 20 minutes, spent $60,000, $160,000. And then we go to the next store. It was mind boggling. 2008 happened, and I say that because all of a sudden, they had budgets because they couldn't be conspicuous in their consumption. They didn't know if their Wall Street bonus was going to be paid the next day. And many of these people, as I would say, because my cohort, they were now aging, they now had children. And they said, oh, I need something healthy. I need a playroom that's eco-friendly because I read in this book that it, there's toxins in a house. So all of a sudden, these people, now they had a budget. And now they had children, and they cared about what happened to their families. So that's when I really realized my business could focus and niche. And that's what we're going to talk about really in my presentation is how do you brand yourself in the sustainability marketplace so that you can earn more money? And especially if you're a student here, how can you say, this is the direction I want to go so that my major pays off in the long term? OK? Um, and let me also take you back. I also suffer from allergies and asthma, if I didn't say that earlier. So the reason why my company in 2003 started actually to focus on eco-friendly design was I would go to job sites where people were con constructing houses, and I'd be wheezing and sneezing that night, or I'd have to have a nebulizer or go to the hospital, and I was sick of doing that. So I said to the guys, every evening you're going to clean up the dust, you're going to wet the space down, so when someone moves into their home, it's a home and not a construction site. And when you're doing design work and you're painting, you're going to take all that dusty stuff away and you're going to clean up every single night so the homeowner can come to visit their space and say, I like it, and they aren't wheezing and sneezing. So we were pioneers in the clean construction area, and I say that because if you look at the niche, asthma allergies drove me to clean construction. Liking, to, liking design, um, both at the eco-friendly level and at the high-end level, drove me to a specific type of consumer. And what you're going to see is, in just a moment, I'm going to show you something on television. In 2005, we started getting phone calls from media people. And they said, oh, you're the green queen. I was like, what? Well, I don't know what that is, but OK, you want to put me on the Today Show? Yeah, I'm the green queen. So that became a media moment where I was branded by the media, and I ran with it. But every time I got on the media, I would say, oh, no, I don't use the term green. I use eco-friendly. So I twisted it. So if you ever in, are in a media situation, remember, go back to your core branding. Don't let them define you. Get on the, do the Today Show, but let, make sure that your message is getting heard. Um, I'm going to show you a four-minute piece because I think it's important to understand how you can be branded 
in the sustainability space or in the eco-friendly space. And I think we're gonna roll, that's the slide. Nope, there it is, okay, here we go. From homes to commercial spaces, this woman is becoming a design powerhouse. We'll meet entrepreneur Robin Wilson tonight as we continue our series, American Dreamers. Robin Wilson Home. It is classic inspiration for a modern lifestyle. Tell us about this motto. Robin Wilson Home is a lifestyle brand committed to educating consumers about healthy lifestyles. And we try to be holistic in our approach from your cabinetry to your bath products, to your bedding products, and also interior design. Eco Interior Consultant and Designer Robin Wilson is a visionary and pioneer who has set the benchmarks for eco-friendly design and has become a leading advocate for clean construction methods. She also authored Kennedy Greenhouse and became the first woman to license her name to eco-friendly kitchen cabinetry. Robin Wilson, good morning. How are you doing? I'm very well. How about yourself? Very good. Thanks for having me today. Tell us how we can be eco-friendly and save money. And joining me now with some design tips for keeping your home a no-allergy zone is Robin Wilson, an eco-friendly interior designer who's also heading up the design of the Kennedy Greenhouse Project. Robin Wilson Home specializes in eco-friendly hypoallergenic decorating for this edition of In the Green. I sat down with Robin Wilson, the CEO of Robin Wilson Home, to find out more about this all-natural remodeling. We actually started our company in 2000 as a project management firm, and then we moved into design because a lot of our clients felt that they wanted one-stop shopping. So the four principles of eco-friendly design are sustainable, reusable, recyclable, and non-toxic. Good morning, Rob, and we're all gearing up for Earth Day. What's new and special that maybe people can right now partake in? Well, I think five products are something your readers, viewers should be aware of, and we want to start with the home. Creating a natural and healthy environment for your household guests can be one of the best things you can do to be the perfect holiday host. Hi, I'm Robin Wilson from Robin Wilson Home. I'm going to show you how to take your house green. Let's get started. We had so much fun doing this, Tara. What was your first thought? You come out here and you see this empty palette and this unbelievable view. What was your first thought? My first thought was golf because it's so green golf. and golf. Woman after my own heart. <laughs> yeah, let's see what you can do. What did he do? He tricked it up a little bit? He tricked it up a little bit. Okay. So let's, let's see. see what a really good putter can do. Oh, that was so, awesome. What about it is eco-friendly? It's actually made out of recycled Sprite and 7-Up bottles. Also on this 12-foot long green was an amazing petrified wood stump from ABC Carpet. Truly a relic of the past, now a sustainable element of design. She's good. She's very good, yes. Real good. Okay, so I showed you that four-minute reel because it's really important to understand that the media can take you in any direction and say, she's the green queen, but you always have to bring it back to what your principles are. And I think that that's very important. Um, I also have some slides I'm about to show in just a second because this is the top secret part of my business. Um, and guess what? We don't have a huge staff. It might look like it. We have me <laughs> um, because of all the... Um, uh, you talked about politics, so I, I, since you opened the door, there's a there's something called Obamacare right now that any business person, if you're a small business or medium-sized business, you get worried about because you don't know if you can pay for health care. So everyone who works for me now is a consultant. And that means um, I... If I do a project, I hire them for the project, and that's it. Because I, I was just being inundated by forms and faxes and taxes, and it was just too much. And I say that deliberately to say, when you start your business, if you're a student, make sure the first two people you have on staff are a great accountant and a great attorney. And they will be your right arm. You may not realize it now, but they will be your right arm. And make sure your bookkeeping is done right, and make sure that, um, that you pay your employees properly, too, through a payroll service. So um, that's the key. Now, marketing sustainability. Um, we can talk all day about the word sustainability. It doesn't mean a thing. Guess what? When I say that, it doesn't mean a thing because a consumer doesn't understand it. What you need to do when you talk to a consumer is you need to say, consumer, you are helping the next generation. Consumer, you are saving the global environment from extinguishing itself. 
by 2050. Consumer, um, you are, instead of having a disposable mindset, and I'll say IKEA, <laughs> you are going to get some heirloom furniture that your child or your grandchild can hand, can have this piece handed down to. If you just say, we're going to be sustainable, the, the consumer's like, uh, okay. But if you say, create an heirloom piece instead of a disposable mindset. Recycle so that the landfills don't get filled up. Um, make sure, I love what Jonathan said about the packaging where it's being turned into toys. Find a way to be part of the solution so that the landfills don't keep getting filled up. Because do you want a landfill in your backyard? No. So at some point, all the landfills will be in our backyards. So you need to find a way to help the consumer understand and grasp the concept that sustainability is a life cycle. It's like, uh, for example, if you have a piece of metal uh, from a ship, um, that's one stage of steel. But I, for example, in my home, have a table that was crafted from a ship, like Costa Concordia, it washed up on a shore, and they just polished the steel up, and now I've got a pretty table. But it, that, could have been, that could have been thrown into the landfill. So it's, it's about creating that life cycle and not just throwing something away. Um, so now we're going to talk about marketing sustainability and how you do it and how you can turn it into dollar signs for your business. So are we up? Are we ready? Okay. So, oops, the font changed on this. Um, I'm sorry. that I have a strange font that we use that if you don't um, know, have that font, it's going to now turn into a digital-looking font. So the key is if you're doing a presentation to someone, if you want to license your brand, um, if you want to tell the media who you are, you need to first define who you are. So this is who we are, an ambassador to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation, started our business in 2000. Um, I became the first woman to license my brand to kitchens. Um, they're sold at 500 dealers nationwide. And Holiday Kitchens happens to be in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. And the reason why I partnered with them is they are amazing. Um, they've been around since 1947. And without the word sustainability, guess what? They've been doing it. They plant two trees for every tree they use in the manufacturing process. They use computerized cutting so that they don't have a lot of waste wood. And any waste wood they have, they turn into, um, what do you call it, litter for guinea pigs and hamsters. And um, they also do cutting boards and, um, and other things that, like little wooden toys. They sell it to those companies that make little wooden toys for children. So they've been doing it. Um, on top of that, they have 50% managers, women, and they work three shifts, but they have um, Six Sigma certification. They turn off their lights. They use the water. They use low VOC paints and stains. So they're a company that was just doing this as their basic business practice. And that is what I call sustainability. Um, oh, and get this. They have a lifetime warranty on their product because they believe in the quality so much that it's not going to need to be ripped out and like you might find at a disposable mindset company. This is our brand platform. Again, this is stuff I don't normally share with people, but I thought you all need to hear this. These are the points. If it doesn't fall in this window, which is eco-friendly, um, asthma allergy, hypoallergenic, sustainability or wellness, or parent focus now, because I've got a baby, um, we don't do it. So if someone says tomorrow, I want you to endorse um, uh, cars, Unless we're doing the interiors of the car, I'm not going to talk about the gas mileage of the car. That's, that's, not, that's out of my space. I don't know anything about that, so it's not my space. So stay narrow. Here are your building blocks. This is the part you need to know. Take a picture of this. I will never show this ever again, okay? This is how you build a brand. You have your online part, your broad reach, which is really social media today, your tags and labels, they should be recyclable. Any print media that you do, you should define what your brand is and what you do. In home, any practices for your clients, that means if you are um, saying to people, use low to no VOC paints and stains, you make sure that you're doing that in your office too and in your home. Um, there's a postcard on that back table. That's my living room. And we use low VOC paints and stains. We have furniture that is durable. Our floors um, in our house are done with a water-based stain and on and on and on. Do it in your home too. Social media and community building. 
let people know what you're doing and make sure that you're authentic in what you're doing. I think that's the biggest key. Um, there are a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in sustainability, and you go to their house and everything in their house is Ikea, which is press board. Um, you go to their house and they've got like a glossy oil-based paint on the ceiling, um, which guess what? It's off-gassing. Um, or they have a vinyl shower curtain, which I did up to two years ago. So just make sure this is, what, this is how to build a brand, folks. This is what you need to do. And you can hire companies that do it for you. Like right now, someone's tweeting as me. I'm not doing it. So at a certain point, you get too busy and you hire people that do this. And with this very fast-moving Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you can spend all your time doing that. And sometimes I suggest hiring someone to do it for you. Um, the company I will recommend is socially, uh, socially Delivered. They're out of Virginia, and they will do it remotely. They have little ambassadors in your area, and they'll do it for you for a couple hundred bucks. These are the four areas of my company. This is what we do. We have case goods um, that we custom design. We have bath products, towels, uh, linens, robes. I've licensed my brand for that. We still do interior design, which is the core of our business. Fashion bedding. Utility bedding is about to be sold at Bed Bath Beyond stores, 100 plus in the US and seven in Canada. Um, and it's hypoallergenic. And uh, just the other day, they got an order for 17,000 pieces, if that gives you an idea of the volume that we're pushing through Bed Bath Beyond. And Bath Amenities is next, um, along with mommy and baby products. So that's 2014, 2015. This is the challenge when you're an eco-friendly designer. How do you harness consumer spending? How do you harness it with relationship to the lifestyle, the health, and the wellness buyer, aspirational buyer? It is a multi-billion dollar market. People don't realize that. It's not a couple of hundred thousand, it's multi-billion. And when you've got, again, I'll use the analogy, 17,000 pieces being pushed out of Bed Bath Beyond and it's the 16th container they've ordered in a quarter, that's a lot of money and that's people literally going to Bed Bath Beyond to say, I want hypoallergenic, I want healthy, because there's plenty of other brands out there. And let me throw this out, mommy bloggers, brides, and health conscious consumers, that's who you should be focused on if you're a designer and you want to build your niche. I've mentioned branding for like the 50th time. Um, every single brand message or platform, whether it's a book, whether it's social media, whether it's web TV, whether it's anything, should be what you're, um, you're staying on message on your brand. We've got a blog. Blogs, if you do blogs, turn it into a book. You could do an ebook that literally, that could happen in one afternoon and just change your content, make it look pretty, and turn it into, um, that's something that we're thinking about doing. You can share things through the web. We've actually got a webisode series that we started called Home with Robin TV. It followed my whole pregnancy. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I will urge you to laugh, um, watch it because I learned, there she is, um, I learned that, uh, I learned that uh, you have to do double the laundry, for example, you do the baby's laundry here, and you know, so I used to be the, oh, you need to wait till the, till the washer is totally full, and then you're being eco-friendly, and all of a sudden you learn, buy a washer that has a mini cycle, so you can do the baby laundry separately. Um, this slide, I won't show you. This is some of the media mojo. Again, this is where we've been in some of the media. Um, I say that because um, it's about branding. I think that was my, yep, that's my last slide. So I'm gonna talk with this slide on the screen um, because this is important. I talk about branding because ten, even 10 years ago, you would just go into a store and say, I want something that's pretty. I want something that's nice. And today you have oh, Ralph Lauren. I want Ralph Lauren. You know, for some people it might be, I want the Kardashian brand at Sears. Um, for others, it might be Robin Wilson Home. Everything is about a brand. So if you're a designer, decide which silo you fit into. You might be the best nursery designer. You might be the best designer for living rooms. Make sure everyone knows that. When you have a press kit, make sure it says that. If you are focused on sustainability, as I hope everyone is here, Make sure that people know that you're an expert in your town or in your area on eco-friendly practices, recyclability, reusability, um, 
and and I'm sorry, my brain is like fried right now. Um, and hypoallergenic practices, in addition to all of the other pieces, because there are consumers that will say, well, you know, she only does sustainability stuff. Well, but it's all tied together. So maybe they need to understand that you're the best nursery designer who also practices sustainable practices in your work. I think that's the key. You want someone to call you up and say, hi, I have a baby nursery um, or my daughter, uh, my grandchild, future grandchild, I wanna hire you. What is your fee? I'm paying you. Make sure it's healthy for them. Um, we are authentic because we started doing project management you are on job sites. I suffer from asthma and allergy. We do clean construction methods. Um, we are focused on sustainability because I'm from Austin, Texas, and I grew up with paper bags and recyclable bags long before uh, people did it. And most importantly, I think the biggest key is I worked at my very first job at the Lower Colorado River Authority, where they focused on power usage and how people leave a light on and think, it's just one light in my house, and don't realize the kilowatt hours. If everyone leaves on just one light, then guess what? In five years, you need a new power plant. They don't think about that. And that was long before, of course, we have LED and CFL light bulbs, but that's also part of sustainability, the practices that you have in your home and in your space. I've got one more page. Um, in furniture and in um, cabinetry, the key, if you are, again, focused on healthy living, you want non-formaldehyde ad adhesives. You want to make sure that the foam is non-toxic and not off-gassing. You want to make sure that the paints and stains on the cabinetry or furniture are low to no VOC. These are words that you can use with your clients. And more importantly, you want to make sure that the packaging is as minimal as possible. I've opened up packaging, um, or let's say you have a chair, and the box is this big, and the chair is this big. Make sure that you're working with companies that care a little bit about the packaging and what they're putting out in the environment. Because do you use that packaging again? You throw it away. And where does it go? To the landfill. Um, I also want to throw out one other thing. Work with companies that do recycling. Again, I used Holiday Kitchens as an example. I know Mitchell does this at his company. They, they donate to companies that plant trees for every tree used in the manufacturing process. If our trees are gone, we can't live. Oxygen, right? So again, sustainability, that whole life cycle, we need to care about that. Um, the word sustainability is defined in many ways. The key to business is, and I use this term very liberally, we talk about, I want to be in design. It's like someone saying, I want to be in show, show business, design business. It is a business. And you might say, what is she doing up here? I'm showing you in business how to make money because it's important that more and more people care about this. And the only way to do it is for people to stay in business, to earn enough money so that they can continue to pass this message on. Because if I talk to, as a designer, 20 consumers in a month and they learn about this, they're going to do more, even if it's one little step. And if I work, if I'm on the media and I can give that message to 20 million people on the Today Show or, or Good Morning America and talk about sustainability and simple things they can do for their home, it's a design business. It's going to bring business to all of you as designers because I'm talking in general, not about my company, but this is what you can do. But if you say, I'm a sustainable designer and did you just see that Good Morning America piece? You might get clients. It's not just me, it's a lot of other designers who are in the media who are talking about it. So again, the word sustainability defined in many ways, but in the design business, the key is does your brand guide the consumer in your direction or in a direction because of the story? Is it compelling for someone to say, I want that, or I want to be part of that movement? Are the words you are using giving, a, giving people a true understanding of what they need to know so they can tell their friends or family why they're paying that 5% extra or 2% extra? Um, my husband didn't know anything about green design or sustainable design. 
And when I said, well, I'm buying this chair. And he's like, this chair is X dollars. What are you talking about? Let's go over here to this store. And I said, this chair has a lifetime warranty. This chair was bench made. This chair we can give to our daughter one day because it's not going to fall apart. And this chair can be recovered 25 times. He's like, oh, okay. You need to know what that sustainable story is. And then the final thing is, you need to give people bragging points if they're buying things from you. So that at the dinner party, and I, this is an old mantra before I say this, um, I learned this being from the South, from Texas, right? At a dinner party, or if something bad happens, eight people will know about it. Because at a dinner party, you're like, guess what happened? Oh my gosh, bless her heart, right? <laughs> okay? If it is really amazing and good, you tell one or two people, because it's a secret. OK, but if it's amazingly good, you tell those same people at the dinner party. Right. Because you're bragging. You're like, guess what? I did this. That. So give your clients a bragging point about sustainability. If you say to someone, you can tell them that they bought this kitchen and this is the number one rated kitchen in the U.S., number one rated kitchen company in the U.S. And guess what? You're going to save 50 percent on all your electric bills because you bought this particular appliance or your water bill because you have this particular plumbing company. And oh, and if you go to Mitchell Gold, because I'm going to give you a plug. You go to Mitchell Gold, you're going to have heirloom quality furniture that can be passed down to your great-grandchildren because it's bench made and it's amazing. That is something someone's going to be like, oh, and you know that chair you see in the living room, my, my new chair, I got it from Mitchell Gold and it's amazing. That is what people need to have. So you can't just be like, well, buy sustainability. Give them something that makes it a woohoo, you know, behind the scenes. And then that will make people continue to purchase sustainable products and also refer them to sustainablefurnishings.org, the SFC website, because in this next year, there are going to be a lot of top 10 lists that are going to come out, sort of like the Forbes billionaire list, and it's going to be things that you need to know so that you can tell your consumers or your future clients, this is why you need to work with this particular company. So that is my presentation. I'm here for 10 or 15 more minutes for Q&A, and thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, I have a lot of clients that are that 1%, but that's only 1% of my client base. So the 99% of my client base, the, what they ask me is, what can I afford? And so what I tell them, um, if they can't buy a new furniture, part of the sustainability story is going to a store like, uh, not Goodwill, but, but uh, in, in New York they have a group called Home Works and that particular Housing Works. And they take gently used furniture from people, from estates and, and others, and they give that money to great charities. Um, they give the product, and then whatever money is made, it goes to charities. So that's part of the sustainability story. It's, you know, I take a beautiful sofa from my home, I donate it to charity, and then Jane Doe, who maybe doesn't have a huge budget, she goes into Housing Works and repurposes that for her home or her space. Um, that's one thing that can be done. Um, another thing is there's a lot of uh, fabric remnant companies for lack of a better word, that have, um, they have 60 yards maybe, and that 60 yards could recover a couch or a chair. And so buy from fabric remnant companies and repurpose a chair, make it beautiful. Um, so again, it's, it's using the, it's, it's saying to yourself, um, if I have a, 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 if I have a brand new sofa, I'm the first person to use it. But in the life cycle, it might go to two or three different places, as long as it's not infested by bed bugs. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, just, just it can be repurposed, recovered, reupholstered, or something of that nature. So. And there is a trend in furniture 
furniture retail to secondhand stores to consignment. That's right. Yeah. That's right. A lot of pe a lot of furniture stores. What you'd also don't remember. Oh, I will tell you this super mega top secret thing. In April and in October, typically the furniture stores are bringing in their next season's product, and a lot of the floor samples go on sale for half price, if not more. So that's when you should shop if you don't have a big budget, because you can get sixty to seventy percent off from a very expensive store. And also the design buildings that happen to be in New York or Atlanta, D.C. Those design buildings buildings, they often are putting in their next line of, um, or next season. So I've actually seen a sofa for $150 before. You just have to pay the U-Haul guy to take it away. But they just want to re, you know, they want to change their entire showroom floor. So April and October is when you should shop if you want to, um, you know. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, that's a wonderful question. Her question is, what is the first thing a student should do to plug into the media machine when they uh, go into the design business? The first thing you should do is have a great website. Um, and in that website, uh, define what you do. So again, as I said, uh, my preference is eco-friendly design. If they want to, uh, if they say, I do great playrooms, which by the way, um, if you're a guy or a woman who has um, an interest in entertainment like equipment, um, like a, a VCRs and big screen TVs, tell everyone that you design man caves. Now, you would not believe, I just had a client that spent $50,000 to redo their basement for their husband after the kids left. So it was like dad's room, big screen TV, his little gym equipment, whatever. They had to you know, do construction. That's why it was so expensive. But I say that, tell people what your interests are, but parse it by saying, I do man caves, I do baby nurseries, I do kitchens. And that way, your client base will grow exponentially through word of mouth, because you're going to do a great job. But more importantly, they know why they're coming to you. Um, the second thing is, there are a lot of lists, whether it's New York Magazine or regional publications. If once you incorporate your company, you can call them and say, can I be added to your designers list, your top designers list? Um, they may say, wait two more years, be in business two more years, but become friends with that reporter, send them a note every time, a picture of your work, and that list can be very accessible to you because then people will look at that list, they leave it on their, on their coffee table, and they'll call you and say, can I see your portfolio? The third thing is get a portfolio. That does not mean using iPhone pictures. That means hiring a professional photographer, $500. They do the right lighting. They do the right angles. And those pictures can then go on your website as you begin to work. Um, you have to remember that you can't recreate the portfolio later. Um, once you do someone's house, it's their house. So you need to do the pictures before you leave, having your contract that you can put their pictures on the website. And take those pictures and really put them on immediately so that someone can say, oh, I see your work. But don't wait to try to do it later. By then, their pets may have scratched up the furniture or something of that nature. So, yep. Next question. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>